Good morning, everybody. Good to see you here in the room, and good to have the people joining online. We've got a very good group of people joining online. Welcome to worship this morning. Um, just a couple announcements, I think, for this morning. Uh, actually, there, a lot of them are related to faith um, and what's going on at faith this week. Um, up just the street here at Broadhead Road um, at Faith Lutheran Church, this week we are having a campfire and communion thing on Wednesday. Um, who went last month? Did anyone go last month? A few of you did. Was it fun? It was great. Everyone here is saying it was like one of the best experiences of their lives. I enjoyed it good. And so we just, it's a real low key sort of thing. It was just a campfire and talking and fellowship and a little bit of a lesson, conversation time and communion. Um, hopefully this month it'll be without the rain, which chased everybody inside for a little bit, right? So like the next six days are sunny every day, except for that day, 50% chance of rain, our bad luck. Um, so that is happening this Wednesday at 7 o'clock at Faith Lutheran Church. Since you still have your calendars out, um, at the end of this month, on the 25th, um, we're doing a craft um, extravaganza at Faith Lutheran Church. Um, there's going to be like 16 vendors there. There'll be food. Um, it's a Saturday afternoon from like 11 to 5 or so in the, in the afternoon. It's going to be a really fun time at Faith Lutheran Church. Go tell all your friends to come to it. You should come to it also, whether you're here or at home watching. Um, and if anyone is interested or able to um, maybe throw some volunteer hours towards helping them out, that would be really appreciated. Um, I know there's going to need to be some outside help on Wednesday beforehand. That's the 22nd. The 23rd, there's going to be some inside cleaning and prep work done. Then 24th, some, uh, the Friday, the day before, some food prep things. And then day of volunteer time. Um, Teresa actually has it all figured out. But if you, anyone from House of Prayer here or any, anyone watching, if you'd like to help out a little bit that week with their big event, um, we'd be grateful for that support. Um, again, we can be really clear on the hours, like late afternoon throughout the week and then pretty much any time throughout the day on Saturday. we got tasks that we need to have done. Um, if you're interested and able to help out, just text or email me or write it in the live stream here, and I'll connect back with you. Emily's watching. Um, and we would love to have all the volunteer help we can. Um, are there any other noteworthy things going on in the parish this week? Is anybody getting married this week? Are there any what, marriages? Just one on Saturday. Pastor Jocelyn's getting married. That is very half-hearted, people. Come on, that's it? Oh, here we go. Fine, yeah. <laughs> and guess what? You are all invited to watch it when it comes out on social media later after the day of the wedding. <laughs> Uh, so that's exciting. Congratulations, and Thank that's you. so fun. I know it's been a very complicated number of days here with your mom being sick, and so yeah. her mom fell. Yeah, so prayers for you and all that stuff, and um, we, we pray for a big excitement this week. Speaking of big excitement, on my other side, <laughs> sitting back there all by himself, Chris, anything happened to you this week, buddy? Uh, I got a job. To my ears, it seemed like there was more applause for Chris's job than Pastor Chaucer. <laughs> and right. Ben played for Chris's job, but not for I Chris. know, right? <laughs> Ben's in big trouble later. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm two plus years, yeah. right? T two. Oh. A long, a very long. long two years. But I, I do want to say a thank you to everybody who has uh, reached out, prayed, tried to help me in any way, shape, or form during these two years, so... Thank you to all of you. You have to say who your employer is. Who hired you? Uh, the, the people who want to hire me are Lutheran Senior Life. So I know, you, I know you're ecstatic about that. I so. am, but you'll be doing what for Lutheran Senior Life? Uh, communication specialist, so corporate communications. Fancy writing, I would imagine, internal, external, social media. Uh, probably interviewing fellow workers or, or uh, people who are at homes and you know telling their story and I don't know, just doing what I can to promote Lutheran senior life. So, yeah. Your first like article or your first big promotion should be promoting you getting the job there. I'll do. New, I'll, I'll, do hire. I'll do a Chris Dason. I'll do a piece on you. <laughs> oh, oh, I know we all want to read about you. Moving on from that. <laughs> Welcome to all the people that are joining online. I I know we've we continue to do this, but I just think it's worthwhile recognizing that, I mean, I can see all of you here in the room, and I'm really grateful to see you all in the room, but we have a lot of people joining online, too. Joyce Bruce was the first one on. Um, actually, I have 22 people that are currently, like, screens that are currently watching online right now. 
Um, then the Kellys were on. Good morning to you guys. Aunt Sharon. Haven't seen Aunt Sharon on in many, many months. Ben is a very, Ben's not in front of the camera anymore, but he's, he's, his hands are in the air and he's ecstatic. Hi, Aunt so, Sharon. Aunt Sharon, I haven't seen you in forever. Oh, my goodness. This COVID stuff. Glad you're joining from, from California, too. So it's a long-distance one. Um, the Weavers, Joyce and Bob, good morning to you guys. The Todds, just down the street here, good morning to you. Pat Nordell, good morning to you. Um, Amy McBride, good morning, good morning, good morning. Stacy and the kids, good morning. Uh, Mary Ann Shears, good morning to you. I love all these good mornings and nice greetings. Carol, Mur Carol Murdoch, good morning to you. Diane Cannon, good morning. Um, Amy says, uh, blessings to you, Pastor Jocelyn, and your, and your marriage. And the lucky man who married you. Oh. His name is Pastor Ryan. He's a pastor yeah. in the Synod here, too. He's a, he's a great guy. Barbara Omi, good morning to you. Um, and Amy says, congratulations to you, Chris. Um, my mom and dad are on this morning. More congratulations to Chris. I'm just going to gloss right over that stuff. Um, uh, yeah, let's see if there's any more. The Spangs are here. Good, the Spangs are in the house. Good morning to the Spangs. Um, and, of course, I see some prayer requests on here. Brian Cole, good morning to you. Glad to have any prayer requests. You can add them on the live stream there. If you're here, sitting here in the room, you could pull out your phone and, like, add stuff in there if you wanted to. Just make sure it's muted. We don't need to hear your phone playing sounds 30 seconds later. Um, you can email me, or, I mean, not email, text me any prayer requests you have, too. We'll read those a little bit later on in the prayers and intercessions. And be involved as much as you are able to be involved. And <laughs> Joe says you can fax it in which case we'll get it in about two weeks. Um, just one word I see, uh, most people have masks on. We are asking across the parish to wear masks, everyone in the room, inside. At home, I think you are allowed to keep your masks off at home. Um, I'd probably be smart there. I know that uh, because one size does not fit all, there have been some people over the last couple weeks that have asked me about wearing masks inside here at church because they have like breathing problems, and I said, that if you have a breathing problem, you cannot wear a mask when you're at church. So just sit off to the side somewhere, and hopefully everyone around wears a mask to try to protect them in those situations. So again, we try to be as flexible as possible, and um, no matter what decision you make, we are urging you and asking you to wear a mask. If you don't, no one will give you the evil eye or accost you on your way in or out of church, or we're just going to love you, because that's what we do here at church. I'll say more about that later. Okay, any other announcements? I'm done. Ben, bring it.
Please stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. It is hard to believe there is enough to share. We question your ways when they differ from the ways of the world in which we live. We turn to our own understanding rather than trusting in you. We take offense at your teachings and your ways. Turn us again to you. Where else can we turn? Share with us the words of eternal life and feed us for life in the world. Amen. Beloved people of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Gracious God, throughout the ages, you transform sickness into health and death into life. Open us to the power of your presence and make us a people ready to proclaim your promises to the whole world. Through Jesus Christ, our healer and Lord. Amen. Well, boys and girls, we're going to read again from our Spark Story Bible today. Um, 
I realize, at least it's come to my attention, that when Pastor Susan and Pastor Jocelyn do the kids' time, they do not read through the Bible just the way, like we've been starting from the beginning, working to the end. They just, they jump around occasionally. Do it that way, and sometimes we do it another way. You know, flexibility. Flex, well, we're going to do it the right way today. <laughs> we can bend the rules. <laughs> We have been uh, just jumping into the stories of Jesus and John being born. I don't think John's name was officially mentioned, uh, but remember last week, boys and girls, for those who joined us, it was the story of Mary meeting with her cousin Elizabeth, and they were both pregnant, and it was this really cool song that Mary sang about how like, her baby would really change things into the way God wanted it. And so today's story um, goes back to John's side of things with Elizabeth, John's mom, and his dad, Zechariah. So... Um, This is sort of about Zechariah, and what this story does not say, but I'm going to tell you, is that um, once Zechariah found out that they were going to have a baby, he and Elizabeth, he couldn't talk for like all those months. So if you know how long um, it takes for a baby to be born, it's like nine months, a long time. That's how long Zechariah couldn't talk. Can you imagine that, boys and girls, not talking for nine months? I see one little one out there. Can you imagine not talking for nine months? No, no, good. Me me neither. Boys and girls at home, let's see if you can go nine months without talking. Yeah, right, huh? I could not go nine months without talking. I couldn't go the rest. I have done a two-day silent retreat, so I can go some distance without talking. Take that. So this is when Zechariah and Elizabeth have their baby John and what Zechariah says. It's on page 208 in our book. Um, 208, if you have yours with you at home or wherever you are, I mean, it looks like this, and the title just says, Zechariah at the top. When their baby boy was just eight days old, Elizabeth and her husband, Zechariah, took the baby to the temple. It was time to give the baby a name, and they chose the name John. Shh, Elizabeth said, baby John is sleeping. But Zechariah couldn't keep quiet. Even if John was sleeping, Zechariah had to share the words God gave him with all the people in the temple. Zechariah was so excited that he sang the good news from God. Zechariah's song told about two babies, John and Jesus. First, Zechariah sang about Jesus. Jesus is coming. Jesus will bring a new beginning. Jesus will turn enemies into friends. Jesus will give us the courage to do good things. Suddenly, baby John woke up and began to fuss. And here's the picture. It's fantastic. Clearly, there's a temple here. That must be the big building in the background. Zechariah and Elizabeth. And John is just screaming his little head off. That's a funny picture. (laughs) That seems pretty accurate for a lot of babies. Yeah, in my experience, that, uh, that looks like a scream. Yeah, that is an unhappy baby there. So then, Zechariah sang about John. You, John, will be a special friend of Jesus. You will help people get ready for Jesus by baptizing them. You will even baptize Jesus someday. You will share the news far and wide that Jesus will come to help us and care for us. Zechariah's song acted as a lullaby for his son. Soon John fell back asleep. and He dreamed of days that were ahead. Shh, Elizabeth said. Baby John is sleeping. It's time to take him home. So Elizabeth and Zechariah took sleeping baby John back home picture here. Looks just like, you know, Elizabeth, she's got some, uh, looks like almost like nervous uh, sweat beads coming off of her there maybe because the baby's awake and sleeping. And and then Zechariah over here, uh, probably nervous because they're in church. And um, I know parents get very nervous when their kids are crying out loud. Uh, They don't need to, but that's the way she looks like there. And and little John there looks just very satisfied. There's a question at the end. Sometimes it's just a statement, sometimes a question. This one says, what song would you have sung 
tell about Jesus and John if you were Zechariah? That's a weird question for me. I don't know why it's weird. I just have a hard time thinking about what song I would sing. Um, maybe the question maybe for me is what, what kind of song, what kind of style would it be? Would it be a, a happy song? Would it be a nervous song? Because the things that John and Jesus do are really huge things that change the world. And they make some people really happy, but also they made some people mad. So if you were telling the story in song, maybe it'd be a little bit of a nervous song or a uh, tense song. Um, Joe wants me to sing it, but there's no way that's going to happen. Ben, Ben's got a big smile on his face like he wants me to sing also. That's not going to happen. Ben can make up a song here in just a few minutes. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I would sing a song that would be like this really strong, uh, almost like a Disney, like big ballad sort of song was to proclaim the immensity of what the two of them would do. Um, it would be full of confidence and full of pride and full of excitement. Um, Zechariah sings a lullaby. I don't think my song would be a lullaby. I think it'd be a, a big, a big powerful Disney song. Um, Joe said Moana, um, and now I've got Disney songs coming out of Ben's fingers there. <laughs> Um, I think that's what my song would be. What would, what would your song look, look, what would it be like? like what, what feelings do you feel when you think about John the Baptist and Jesus? Yeah, you did eat locusts? It could be a Beatles song. It could be something from A Bug's Life. Put that mask back up. <laughs> Jonah would definitely say a Beatles song because he loves Beatles music. He wants to listen to the Beatles all the time. Yeah, so boys and girls, think this week about the story of Jesus, and I would encourage you to think about the feelings that makes you feel. Like, does it make you feel confident, excited, proud? I mean, one of the big things you should always know is that you're loved, because Jesus always loves you. So no matter what song you come up with, how you sing it, um, the, the feel, the vibe of it, it should be one where you know that you are really, really loved. Because no matter what happens in life, no matter what good things or struggle things, um, Jesus loves you always. Amen. Mine would be an 80s power ballad, is what I would do. So, seems very appropriate. <laughs> Our first reading today is from Isaiah chapter 35, verses 4 through 7a. Say to those who are of fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, and the thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Psalm for today is Psalm 146, verses 1 through 10. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will praise the Lord. Long as I live, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live, 
I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. When they breathe their last, they return to earth. And in that day, their thoughts perish. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help whose hope is in the Lord their God who made heaven the earth the seas and all that is in them who keeps promises forever gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who hunger. The Lord sets the captives free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and the widow. But it frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, through all, all the generations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. tall task to follow that up, Ben. That was very good. Our second reading is from James chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. My brothers and sisters, do with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the other one who is poor you say, stand there, or sit at my feet. Have you not made the distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? 
But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you. It is not they who drag you into court. It is not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you. You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law of transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. Now if you do not commit adultery, but if you murder, you become the transgressor of law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and the one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. As you're able, please rise for our gospel. Our gospel today is from Mark chapter 7, verse 24 through 34. Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice, but a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she entered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by the way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to the heaven, he signed, sighed and said, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. I'd like to act out the second part of this Gospel. Is there anyone that will come forward so I can spit on my hands and then touch your tongue? Get out of here. <laughs> Pastor Jocelyn? No. Nope. All right, let us pray. The words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, if you're not going to let me act out the second part of the gospel, I'll just talk about the first part of the gospel. This poor woman that comes to Jesus, I mean like poor, like money-wise poor, but just like this poor, desperate woman that comes to Jesus. This is probably a story that for some you've heard it a bunch of times, and for others maybe this is your first time hearing it, and it's a weird sort of story. So let me do a little bit of like background on it here. Um, so it says in the very first verse that Jesus is um, he's setting out and goes away to the region of Tyre. Um, I don't know a whole lot about Tyre, never been to that part of the world ever, but um, from what I understand, this is a, a part of the world that was not Jewish. So G Jesus is heading on vacation, Right? Just like all of us go on vacation. Why, and why do we go on vacation? To get away from all the people, right? To get away from all the stuff, the busyness of life, the work, the job. This is why I went to Maine, to get away from all of you. No, I didn't. That's not why. That's not why. <laughs> yeah, I, I, but I think it's true here that Jesus is going intentionally out of his Jewish areas. And he does go through, like, other non-Jewish areas sometimes. But I think intentionally this time it's to try to get away, to try to relax, to try to just get some Sabbath in his life. Because the next sentence says... He entered a house and didn't want anyone to know where he, that he was there. Totally relatable. 
introvert. I, after I'm with people, I'm like, now I'm done with people, and I'm going to go away to my house where hopefully no one will know I'm here, and if they do, they won't bug me. Unfortunately for Jesus, he gets bugged right away. <laughs> the next sentence, the writer of Mark says this, I love it. Yet, he could not escape notice. Even in his not area, like in, in this foreign area, among people that are not of his tribe, his ethnicity, his race, his religion, even there, people know who he is and know what he can do. We're in the seventh chapter here. By now, John has, or Jesus has done some stuff. Um, Mark has told us about some of the things, some of the miracles, the teachings, the wisdom stories, the moral teachings. People know who he is, and including this woman. So I think probably many of you know that like back then, it was an extremely patriarchal society. We still live in the remnants of that to some degree, but back then, we're like super patriarchal. It was not okay for women in general to come up and just talk to men, um, especially if that man was a person of some significance, which, which Jesus is, and um, you know, a, a teacher, even if you didn't know much about the Jews, it would recognize his prominence. And just, it would have been very inappropriate for a woman to just come up and talk with Jesus. Um, and the writer of Mark here makes a, a point to say um, her background. Um, so a woman, she shouldn't really be talking to him. But she's also Syrophoenician. So she's like Syria, Syrian and Greek. And it seems like the whole point that Mark is trying to make here is that she is completely not his people. Right? Racially, ethnically, religiously, faithfully. No. She, she, he is us. She is them. Complete opposite. And yet she shows up at this random house, this Airbnb that Jesus got. It wasn't an Airbnb. She shows up at his door. I presume she knocks on the door. I don't know. Um, that's how I imagine. She like, you know, knocks on the door, and he like opens the door, and she sees him and just drops to her knees and like prostrates herself in front of him. Again, she's not Jewish. It's really an amazing like position of respect and um, just acknowledgement that he can do something special. And so um, she's there, and I think she says, um, she just, it just says she begged him to cast a demon out of her daughter. And so this is also relatable for us. Like, as much as we can relate with Jesus for going off by himself on vacation just to get away, we can relate with this woman, right? Even though he is not of her race, ethnicity, religion, she is desperate. Like, wouldn't those who are parents pretty much do anything for their kid to get made healthy if they were sick? Or, I mean, we don't have to be parents to do it. Like, think of the people you love the most in life. If something happened to them, and wouldn't you do just about anything to try to, like, make them healthy again? So you can understand what, you know, her willingness to do this. She shows up at his door, prostrates herself, and begs Jesus to heal her daughter. He says this. Let the children be fed first. It isn't fair to give the children's food and throw it to the dogs. For those who have heard this story before, you've heard this, you've heard this set of statements. What the heck does it mean, though? It, have you found yourself confused and then be like, yeah, Pastor Mike or Chris just read that story, but I have no idea what it means. That was crazy. Maybe not. That's, what, that's the way they sort of felt at faith. They're like, yeah, that's, people that have been around, they didn't know what to make of this story. Let the children be fed first, for it isn't fair to take the children's food and give it to the dogs. I know whenever one of my kids say it's not fair, the next thing that's going to happen is probably going to be pretty stupid. Or it's going to be a little bit out of, misguided, out of context. So it's interesting that Jesus uses this phrase. So every time I try to parse out one of these parables, I'm quick to say, you know, to the question, what does this mean? How do we interpret this? Let me just say, I don't know. I wasn't there 2,000 years ago. There's a lot of, like, nuance and tone of voice and all that kind of stuff lost, plus 2,000 years worth of just, you know, ritual and how life is lived that's between Jesus doing this and us here now. So I don't know what Jesus meant or how this dialogue went down. But here, after a lot of reading and thinking about this, is what here's a possibility, we'll say it that way. Uh, he starts off by saying, let the children be fed first. I think what that means is that, so in, in the first century, the word the children was sort of like a colloquialism for the Jews, the children of Abraham, the, the children of God. Um, so Jesus is saying, let the children be fed first. Um, which the Jews sort of had that mindset that they, once they were taken care of, once they were under God's light and protection, then they would be 
that light and protection and care and witness to the whole world. So Jesus says, let the children be fed first. Let the Jews get theirs first. And then he says, it isn't fair that the food for the children would go be thrown to the dogs. So I wonder if he's thinking of himself. He is the Messiah, the one who has come for the Jews. He is the food. And it isn't fair to give that food that should belong to the children of Israel, the Jews, to the dogs. Who's the dogs? The woman prostrated in front of him, right? The Gentile, the non-us, the non-Jew, the non-our people. She's a them. And not only is she a them, she's a she too. So that's like an even more outsider sort of way of being. It's not fair that the Messiah should come and be given to the dogs, to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. The Messiah is for us, the children, the insiders. How's that phrase sit with you, friends? A little awkward? A little uncomfortable? Like that Jesus would talk like that? Okay, just me. I find it uncomfortable and awkward that Jesus would talk like that. So the ball's now in her court, and she responds by saying this. Sir, even the dogs under the table, they eat the children's crumbs. So it's sort of an analogy, but in, the, in reality, that is also what happens, right? I've got three kids. They're animals at the table. Um, food's flying everywhere. I say, eat at the table, and we go to take a bite like this, and we sit back and take the bite like this, and the food goes all over the place. There's lots of food that finds itself to the floor where our dog is. So the crumbs do indeed fall to the dog at our house. So literally, that is how things work. And her analogy is also fascinating, right? She takes his language, which in some ways can be construed as quite demeaning, calling her a dog, her and other Gentiles a dog. She uses that imagery again without pushing back on him and saying, how dare you? You know, why do you call me that? Instead, she uses that to say, but even the crumbs that fall from the children's table will be eaten by the dogs. It's pretty crafty of her pretty non-threatening. Pretty, in many ways, it's better decorum than he offers to her in the first place. And so for that, Jesus says this back to her. For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she goes home, finds the child lying in bed, and the demon's gone. The end. That leaves a lot wanting for me. If that interpretation that Jesus is sort of harsh and unnecessarily mean to her, and then she responds back with much more grace, and then he just heals her daughter at the end. If that's the way that sort of dialogue goes, it leaves me wanting, because I want Jesus to apologize, right? Or at least acknowledge that the language he used could have been a little better, could have been a little kinder, could have been a little nicer, could have been more respectful, but he doesn't do that. It doesn't at least say that in the text. But something does happen there in his heart. He changes if that's the way the story goes, where he comes across sort of angry. And can't we understand his initial demeanor? At least I can. I, I can relate to Jesus um, coming across kind of harsh. A have you ever just been around people a lot, or just life has been tense or extreme, or you've, just, you, you, you've had it up to here, and then that person comes to you, right? And you don't respond as gracefully as you could. Has this happened to any of you? Have I done it to any of you? <laughs> I feel like I do this a lot. Like I've just, my threshold is like at this level, it usually happens probably to my kids the most. Like I come home and I'm just exhausted and the, and, you know, the kids does something, one of the kids does something just slightly wrong. I'm like, why did you do that? Just totally inappropriately just like went crazy on them. It's just the way we, it goes sometimes, right? We just we get filled up with all the emotion of the world, with all the tension of our jobs, with life, with family, with people. And we just, like, lose it in the craziest places. I think that's where Jesus is here. And, I, and again, I can relate to that. And beautifully, it's the them, the Gentile, the woman, that looks back at him and, and replies in kind, with grace, with compassion, and says, yeah, but, like, even in the world you know, like, there's still enough grace even for me. And I really wonder, I mean, Mark doesn't say it, but I really wonder if in that moment, like, it's like the Disney moment or the Grinch moment, you know, where his heart, like, is really small and then it gets really, really big and, like, explodes out of the x-ray thing in the Grinch movie. You've watched the Grinch movie, right? Yes. Like, it's that sort of, like, 
where Jesus, you know, his heart has gotten real small because people have just been so harsh on him and he's been healing so many people. And this woman redeems his hope and humanity. And he sees the beauty even in the one that is not his. Even in the one that frustrates him. The ones that's them, that's been, that angers you. This is relatable stuff for the world we're living in right now, is it not? Aren't there people in our lives that we're just like, I'm mad at with you. We just want to, like I said this last week in the sermon, you just want to like, take them around the neck and say, what is going on in your brain? Why do you think like this? Right? And, and there's been this accumulation of this tension um, that just keeps building in our world ever. I mean, there's always a certain level of tension for all of us. But the last year and a half have really built this up. We are in Jesus' shoes where we just can't get away from it. And then we find ourselves just, just emoting in all these harsh, tough, mean sorts of ways. So I keep wondering to myself, in the world we live in right now, what can I do to try to like turn the tides a little bit, recognizing that that's the way it is in the world? What can I do? I mean, I'm not like, you know, a leader in the world. I'm not a leader in the country. I'm not like the president or um, a, you know, a significant political figure. I'm not an athlete that has you know, millions of, of Twitter followers or Instagram vi- people that follow you. I'm not a newscaster on CNN or Fox News that has you know, mass crowds that will listen to what I say. How do I start pushing back at this just anger with one another, this, this just anger at the others for their decision-making, for the things they believe? Um, and the truth is, like, it's, it's us. Like, as we look around the room here, or we think about, like, those in our spheres, our world, it, this is our family that we're frustrated with, right? It's, it's people in our church. It's people that are, we go to work with. It's people that, are, that we are part of the fraternal clubs with or people that are in our circles that, like, when we see them post on Facebook, we're like, oh, my gosh, not again right? Or they start talking about the thing they're talking about again. You're like, oh my gosh, how are they on this thing yet again? How, how are they so dense? How come they don't get it? I mean, the truth is we don't agree with each other. Even in this room, part of our larger, larger church community. And so what do we do? How do we continue to be community with each other? And here's what I've come up with. Here's what I can say from my spot as pastor. We are going to be people of decorum. We're going to be people of love and compassion and grace. I suspect, for those who have been around here for a long time, or even those who are fairly new, you've probably heard me say something in a sermon or other places where you're like, that dude has lost it. He's an idiot. I don't agree with that one bit. In fact, that actually makes me mad. I don't like it when he says that kind of stuff. Right? Ben said, heck yeah, this morning at Faith, yeah. Um, that, that's the way it is when we live in community. We sometimes say things, uh, we believe things, um, we have understandings of the world that conflict with one another. As I look across my social media and interact with the people of our church, I disagree with some of you on things. A lot. Some of the things I disagree with very wholeheartedly, and I really think I'm right. But you know what? I love the heck out of you. I love the heck out of all of you. And I refuse to let that part of our relationship be what defines us. And I think that's at the heart of where Jesus is here. He's at his, the height of his tension level, and this woman comes in, and she is not in his agreement part, not part of his crew, his in people that think and believe like he does, and he wants to turn off the faucet and be mean to her, and maybe he does a little bit. But then as he looks long, as he takes a longer look at her and sees her for who she is, he can't help but love her. I encourage you to that work today, and in the days ahead. Don't let the people who you disagree with be made so small as to just, it's that issue. Love them. Love them for so much more than that. Last week, here and online and at Van Kirk, I had everyone, I gave you all a piece of paper. You had to write three people that you were really angry with or frustrated about or groups of people. And then I made you write three things that you loved about that person or at least were lovable about them. Again, I encourage you to see the people in your world as much more than one topic, much more than just masks or vaccinations or whatever the thing is. Our love as people who follow Jesus has to be much larger than that. We are people of unbridled grace, compassion, and love. Amen.
Together with the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. position most comfortable you please be seated or kneel. Our response today is hear our prayer. May children and heirs of God's promise we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you bring your people together in worship. Enliven your church. Guide all the evangelists, preachers, prophets, and missionaries who seek to share your love through the word and deed. Lord, in your mercy. You provide water for thirsty ground and sunshine to feed hungry plants. Bless all who are advocate for healthy forest, un unpolluted air, and clean waterways. Inspire all people to show care for the world you have made. Lord, in your mercy. You show no partiality. Increase justice in all nations. Encourage leaders and governments to work with one another for the good of our common world. Unite us in seeking the health, safety, and dignity of all. Lord, in your mercy. You accompany those who are most in need. Shelter all fleeing violence or persecution. Protect any who are in danger and sustain them through uncertain and unstable times. Lord, in your mercy. You support the work of your disciples. Continue to nurture the leadership and ministries of this congregation. Lord, in your mercy. We lift up prayers offered up this morning from this gathered community, both here in the room and those who gather from afar. We lift up the prayers of one who prays for patience while waiting for God to reveal what his purpose is. Denny lifts up continued healing prayers for Anna and those dealing with medical issues. Amy offers up prayers for her COVID-19 booster shot. And then prayers for Alana, Monica, and Scott. Susie lifts up prayers for cousin Sissy. Joyce prays for Pastor Jocelyn and her family. Healing prayers for Ken. Net, Donna, and Tom. And also prayers for friend Pat, who is having knee surgery on Tuesday. Diane prays prayers for Amy, Ginger, and Michelle. Mary Ann prays prayers for family and friends still fighting cancer and COVID. Brian prays prayers for Sue. Amy lifts up prayers for those with COVID and those in quarantine. Pat offers prayers for family and friends and everyone in need. Joyce asks for prayers for Sissy, Donna, and Bill. We pray that this Saturday would be a day of joy and excitement for Pastor 
Jocelyn and Pastor Ryan. We pray your care over all the heaviness in the world that exists simultaneously alongside our joys. We pray that our hearts would be softened when we're frustrated or at our end. We pray that our ears would be quick to listen for your words and that those words would soften our hearts. Right now, we spend just a moment to listen. In a world where we do most of the talking, stating how we feel, what we want, giving our agenda, let's pause for just a moment so we can listen to God for your agenda. We'll leave a space here and we'll watch this happen. ascending. Our prayers are always ascending. And Jamie asks for prayers for her brother-in-law, Pat Carter. Also prayers for teachers and children in the world. We pray that you hear all these prayers. Lord, in your mercy. You embrace all who have died in the faith and brought them into your glorious presence. We thank you for their example and rejoice in lives. Lord, in your mercy. Receive these prayers, O God, and those in our hearts known only to you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we prepare to gather around our Lord's table once again, we remember that on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. May the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Go in peace. You are the body of Christ. We are. Thanks be to God. And may the peace of Christ be with you always.